At daybreak, the generals came together, and they wondered that Cyrus neither sent anyone else to tell them what to do, nor appeared himself. They resolved accordingly to pack up what they had, arm themselves, and push forward until they should join forces with Cyrus. When they were on the point of setting out, and just as the sun was rising, came Procles, the ruler of Teuthrania, a descendant of Demaratus, the Laconian, and with him Glus, the son of Tamos, and they reported that Cyrus was dead. And that is the opening of Book 2 of Xenophon's Anabasis. In the last episode, we looked at some highlights from Book 1, and I'm going to continue on this week with some highlights from Book 2. There are seven books in total. I'm Alex Petkus. You're listening to the Cost of Glory podcast, where our main mission here is to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman leaders from Plutarch's lives. Uh, but in my research for these biographies, I read a lot of other great books, and they contain what I think are insights for leaders and makers and doers today. So I'm sharing with you the best parts that I've encountered in my research that I couldn't fit into the biography episodes. Um, so let's get into this. And just a note here, this week as I'm recording this, uh, Turkey has been in the news a lot this past week because of a massive earthquake. It's a tragic disaster. And one of the hardest hit cities, Adana, is a place that Cyrus and the Greeks went right past in the last episode. Um, it's in Cilicia near Tarsus. So let's get into it. Now, book one was a little bit of a cliffhanger for the Greeks fighting under Prince Cyrus. They won the battle against the Persian king's troops, against Artaxerxes, at least on their side of the field. Um, but as they don't know, but Cyrus has died in the battle. And so they actually retire to their camp and they go to bed that night in a state of confusion and the fog of war, you might say, stick on the battlefield. And they don't know what happened. Uh, maybe Cyrus is chasing the king. He's chasing the king in a, in a victory pursuit. Um, it's, it's chaos. And so they go to bed um, without dinner. They wake up and they don't have any breakfast to eat. And then they get the news, as we heard in that, in that first quote. And so the big question of this chapter of, of book two of Anabasis is, is obviously, well, what should we do now for the Greeks? Uh, but uh, so much of that question how to answer it depends on the much harder question to figure out, which is what does the Persian king really intend to do with them or to try to do with them? So in addition to that message about the king being dead, the same messenger tells them that Arius is nearby. Now, Arius is a man on their side. He was one of the Persian nobles who defected and, and marched with Prince Cyrus, took an army with him. I think he was a satrap or something. And Arius is saying, okay, he's telling them where he's camped and he intends to flee back to uh, where they came from, to the Asia Minor coast. And he's inviting them to come along, but don't take a lot of time to decide because he's leaving tomorrow. They got to get out of there quick, right? The king's in the vicinity with his army. Um, and so... Arias is a, he's a man to pay attention to in this chapter. He's going to come up again. Uh, and so the Greeks, they get this message. They're very distressed, understandably. And here's what Xenophon says happens next. Here's what they say to the messengers. Well, the generals, upon hearing this message and the rest of the Greeks, as they learned of it, were greatly distressed, as I said. Uh, Clearchus, however, said, quote, Well, would that Cyrus were alive, but since he is dead, carry back word to Arias that for our part... We have defeated the king, that we have no enemy left, as you see, to fight with, and that if you had not come, we should now be marching against the king. And we promise Arias that, if he will come here, we will set him on the royal throne. For to those who are victorious in battle also belongs the right to rule. And uh, so that's Clearchus, the Spartan kind of preeminent figure and um, kind of the tragic hero of book two. And we're going to come back to him in a moment. Uh, so that's that's the situation they're offering Arias. Well, Cyrus failed, but uh, well, he died, but you know, we succeeded. 
and uh, well, why don't you succeed too and claim the throne for yourself? We won on the battlefield after all. So that messenger goes back, and in the meantime, they get an embassy from the king himself. Uh, there's a Greek guy in this embassy, and that Greek guy, Philinus, does all the talking to them. Um, and yes, the Persian king does have Greeks on his side too. Another famous one of them was Ctesius of Cnidos, um, famous in the ancient world. He was a doctor for Artaxerxes, and he actually wrote his own history of these events. And he writes a kind of alternate side of things from the Persians' perspective that you can read about in Xenophon's Life of Artaxerxes. Um, so uh, the king, Philinus, this Greek guy, uh, conveys to the, the Greek commanders left on the battlefield, the king wants the Greeks' unconditional surrender. In other words, give up your weapons. Here's our offer. Give up your weapons and go plead for mercy with the king. <laughs> so the king, or Philinus, uh, on the king's behalf, they're acting like they won. And the Greeks think that they won. <laughs> so a debate ensues. And Clearchus says, well, you know, it's not the victors who give up their arms after battle. And uh, Xenophon's friend, Proxenus of Thebes, uh, one of the other generals there, um, we'll hear about him later. He says, well, is the king asking for a present? Maybe, maybe he should ask more politely. Uh, otherwise, if he's really the victor, uh, why doesn't he come and take our weapons himself if he really controls the battlefield? The Greeks are kind of taking a hard line here. And... Then, uh, interestingly, Xenophon here speaks up himself. So he's apparently standing there. He's, again, he talks about himself in third person in this whole book, um, this whole work. Uh, so he's, he's there because he's a friend of Proxenus. And Xenophon speaks up. And, um, you know, I think we get a little hint here that Xenophon is kind of a key man here, or at least he's, he's well connected to key people in the campaign. It's not his, totally his first appearance, but um, this is you know, uh, an important kind of scene in building Xenophon's character. And here's what Xenophon says. Then Xenophon, an Athenian, said, Phalinus, at this moment, as you see for yourself, we have no other possession save arms and valor. Now, if we keep our arms, we imagine that we can make use of our valor also. But if we give them up, that we shall likewise be deprived of our own lives. Uh, do not suppose, therefore, that we shall give up to you the only possession that we have. Rather, with these, we shall do battle against you for your possessions as well. Um, and uh, when he heard this, Faulinus, he laughs, and he says, Why, you talk like a philosopher, young man, and what you say is quite pretty. Be sure, however, that you are a fool if you imagine that your valor could prove superior to the king's might. Um, so Faulinus really comes off as kind of a blowhard here. But, you know, he does have a point that they are still quite outnumbered um, by the king's forces in the in the nearby vicinity. So the, the negotiation there basically fails, and the king's embassy with this Greek guy, Philinus, goes back. Meanwhile, messengers from Arias come back. So they're, they're you know, they're still trying to figure out what are, what are they going to do. And Arias, I'm going to quote what he says here. I think it's kind of interesting. Arias says that there are many Persians of higher rank than himself, and they would not tolerate his being king. But the messengers continued, if you wish to make the return journey with him, he bids you come at once during the night. Uh, otherwise, he says he will set out tomorrow morning. So I think this is an interesting kind of reflection here. You know, if you want to be the leader, you have to consider who the other bidders are, kind of, kind of obvious there, but other people might not tolerate you being the leader if uh, if they think that they can do it instead. So that's the position that Arias is in. So he's going to go back um, and not try to make a bid at the kingship. And Clearchus gives a kind of a non-committal answer. He says, we're going to think about it, and they send the messengers back. And and then he, he takes counsel with the generals, uh, the Greek generals, and he gives his opinion on the best choice. And that is... The king is now on the other side of the Tigris. So if we want to attack him, we don't really have a way. We have no boats. 
Um, and there aren't really any provisions where they are now. They've, uh, they've all been eaten, and uh, it's, it's not a very hospitable terrain that they happen to be in. And Arius was a friend of Cyrus. Uh, he's our best bet. We, we, we should trust him to some extent, at least. He's, he's the best option we have no, now, so he says, let's go join up with Arius. And this is the moment when Clearchus becomes the de facto leader of the Greek army, because before he was kind of the preeminent among Cyrus's Greek generals, but he wasn't, he, he's not the leader of the Greeks when Cyrus is dead. It's not really clear that that should be the case, but he speaks up and, um, and, and Xenophon says, and thenceforth he commanded and they obeyed, Clearchus that is, not that they had chosen him, but because they saw that he alone possessed the wisdom which a commander should have, while the rest were without experience. So Clearchus here basically just gives his really kind of uh, cold analysis of the situation, of the facts on the ground, and offers his course, his, his, his idea on what the best course of action is. And, and so they end up kind of choosing him as leader. Again, this is a pattern we see um, in the Anabasis that the people who, when everybody's kind of confused and it's not clear which direction they should go and it's not clear who's in charge, the person who gives the best counsel often ends up leading. So that's a thing you might, you might be able to take away if you're in a situation like that, you know, do some analysis, sit down and, uh, and look at the facts and give a recommendation to the group based on that analysis. And, you know, be careful. You, you might get picked to, to run the operation. So, um, so they go, they go on and they join with Arias and, uh, still not really, confident in the plan, but it's the best plan that they have. And they swear oaths with, with each other, with Arias, not to betray each other, etc. And they then they have to decide what the route that they're going to take is, because they've taken this route from the Euphrates River, which kind of runs from the uh, from the west to the east, from kind of the near the Mediterranean coast down into Iraq, in a kind of a southeasternly direction. Um, but uh, Arias gives his opinion we can't take that route back because don't you remember the last basically 20 days of marching on that route? We ate basically everything within miles and miles and whatever wasn't eaten by us was burned by the enemies on our way. They, they had a kind of a scorched earth policy. So there's really no provisions on the way back along the Euphrates river. We have to take a different route. And so uh, this is going to be challenging and the route that he proposes is basically to take the Tigris River, the other river that bounds Mesopotamia, which is further to the east, but also runs kind of more uh, from a north-south on a north-south axis. So they have to go north. And that's his opinion. And uh, he's got a big army. So they say, well, we'll follow you. And they're planning to follow him all the way back to Greece. They set out north, and uh, I'll kind of skip through all of this stuff. They're going along this uh, this route, and, and there's some tense moments. So the king sends his army, uh, or some part of his army, to follow them in the area. And as the king's army is following them, they don't really know if the king wants to let them go or to try to destroy them. And remember, there's a kind of a paradox here. There's a kind of a stalemate. The Greek army, the army currently gathered, Greeks plus barbarians, uh, Arias, has, has basically proven that it can defeat the army that the king has mustered. So you can understand the king's hesitance to engage them in battle. But then the question is, can they do it again without the morale that Cyrus provided them and the, the leadership and the, the kind of figurehead? And, and, and even if they were to gain a victory, I mean, especially in the likely, likely event that the king would retreat and, you know, go raise another army to destroy them, try to destroy them again. He could easily do that. He's got almost unlimited resources. I mean, you can understand why neither side really wants to fight here. There's, there's not a lot to be gained and there's a lot to risk. And the Persians, the, the Persian king, that is, he eventually offers a kind of a truce and the Greeks accept and they say they'll, 
basically the king offers to let them uh, supply themselves in a nearby village or you know series of villages and he won't interfere and uh, the Greeks accept and there are a few interesting passages here I won't give a ton of context necessarily for them but there's really a, a lot of interesting insights into the character of Clearchus that uh, Xenophon really he kind of admires this man um, and I want to just read you a couple of passages about Clearchus here However, as the night went on, a panic fell upon the Greeks also, and there was confusion and a din of the sort that may be expected when panic has seized an army. Clearchus, however, directed Ptolemides the Elean, who chanced to be with him as herald, and was the best herald of his time, to make this pro proclamation after he had ordered silence. The commanders give public notice that whoever informs on the man who let the ass loose among the arms shall receive a reward of a talent of silver. And this proclamation is made and the soldiers immediately calm down. So basically it seems that the soldiers were, you know, some people were kind of panicking and rushing to get their swords and, thinking that they were getting attacked in the night. Maybe they were acting on bad information. And so Clearchus basically kind of plays a trick on his own soldiers. And he, he, you know, he has to explain the sound. And he basically says that somebody let, let a donkey loose among the arms, <laughs> which, is, which was nonsense. But, uh, but it gave people a kind of a, a plausible explanation and uh, allowed them to save face. And uh, so he calms down the Greeks. And the next morning he orders them up to get ready for battle, um, just in case, but nothing happens. Um, and then the, some of the messengers come from the king. This is actually where the king's messengers offer peace, but I think this is kind of an interesting scene. So he comes forward um, with the best armed and best looking of his own troops, and he tells the other generals to do likewise. Um, so he likes to, he, he really likes to play to set the stage psychologically for basically everything that happens whenever he can get the chance. He wants to get, you know, he, he actually, before this scene, he goes and he, he has all the like weak and wounded people. Um, and like this kind of scrawny looking soldiers, like hidden in their tents. And he, he wants the Persian Im ambassadors when they come to, to only see just like the buffest and most put together looking Greek soldiers. And there's another passage here where he wants to get a psychological edge after the messengers give their offer, Clearchus goes and he huddles with the Greeks. And uh, when they had said this, Clearchus had them retire and took counsel about the matter. And it was thought best to conclude the truce speedily so that they could go and get provisions without being molested. And Clearchus said, I too agree with this view. Nevertheless, I shall not go so to report at once, but I shall delay until the messengers get fearful of our deciding not to conclude the truce. You know, he's always just trying to get a, a few more psychological legs up on the enemy. And, you know, I'll sk skip some of these patches, but there's a lot of places in here where Xenophon really makes clear. Clearchus is a very smart guy, and he's a very crafty guy. He realizes that the king is probably flooding the irrigation ditches in the area that they're in to make it kind of more difficult for them to move if they want to maneuver. So he's a very observant leader as well. All right. And they get some provisions from this nearby village when the truce is called. I'm reading you a little passage here that I thought was funny. The march at length brought them to villages where the guides directed them to get provisions. In these villages was grain in abundance and palm wine and a sour drink made from the same, from the palm wine, by boiling. As for the dates themselves of the palm, the sort that one can see in Greece were set apart for the servants, while those laid away for the masters were selected ones, remarkable for their beauty and size, and with a color altogether resembling that of amber. Others again they would dry and store away for sweetmeats. These made a pleasant morsel also at a symposium, but were apt to cause a headache. Here also the soldiers ate for the first time the crown of the palm, which uh, I think is the leafy part. And most of them were not surprised, uh, most of them were surprised, not alone at its appearance, but at the peculiar nature of its flavor. This too, however, 
was exceedingly apt to cause headache. So next, the Greeks get approached by Tissaphernes. Do you remember Tissaphernes from the last episode? Tissaphernes is the satrap of Lydia, who was, according to Xenophon, responsible for the quarrel that Cyrus and Artaxerxes had in the first place. He told what Xenophon says was a lie, that Cyrus was plotting against Artaxerxes, and you know he, he basically caused the quarrel between them and Artaxerxes imprisoned Cyrus and so on. And, and Tissaphernes is the guy who ran back to Babylon with his army once he saw Cyrus gathering an army and notified the king that he should prepare for war with his brother. So Tissaphernes is a very loyal servant of the king. Well, Tissaphernes comes to them with this story that he knows the difficulty that the Greeks are in. And he knows Greeks and their character, and he knows that they understand about friends and favors and that they know how to return a favor. And so he thought if he could arrange something where they could be spared, that uh, that they that he might win them over as friends. Uh, so the Greeks take counsel. This seems kind of plausible. They say, all right. He comes back and he says, well, you know, I really had to negotiate hard for you guys because there were a lot of Persians who thought that the king should not spare you, but uh, here's the deal. And he proposes that they swear oaths, one that he will escort them out, provide a market, do no harm to them. And the Greeks have to swear an oath that they will not harm the king's territory or ravage his lands. Um, and so, so they're basically going to rely on the Persians for their supplies. And Tissaphernes, remember, you know, this is how ancient commanders do it. When they're supplying an army, they just bring in merchants. They provide a market to sell to the soldiers. And Tissaphernes agrees to do that. And then he offers to escort them all the way back north along the route that they're taking, all the way back to Lydia. Um, he's leading his own army back to Lydia to return to his province. So they can, they can come back home with him. And uh, so, that's a good thing, right? Well, Tissaphernes goes back to the king to finalize things or something, uh, and then they, they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and then they wait some more. And he, Tissaphernes ends up being gone for 20 days. The king is back in... In Babylon, and you know, they're a few days march from Babylon, so um, it's kind of a long time to be away, though. And while Tissaphernes is away, arranging things with the king or whatever he's doing, remember they've got this other Persian noble, Arius, camped with them, their ally, the friend of the late Cyrus, and uh, all of these important Persians start coming to Arius, his relatives and friends and nobles bringing messages from the king, uh, and they're all reassuring him that Arias has got nothing to worry about, the king forgives him, and as things progress, it sort of seems that Arias is having less and less time to visit with the Greek leaders, and some of the Greeks start to get nervous, and they come and approach Clearchus, and I'll read you what they say, according to Xenophon. They say, why are we lingering? Do we not understand that the king would like above everything else to destroy us in order that the rest of the Greeks may also be afraid to march against the great king? For the moment he is scheming to keep us here because his army is scattered. But when he has collected his forces again, there is no question but that he will attack us. Or perhaps he is digging a trench or building a wall somewhere to cut us off and make our road impassable. For never, if he can help it, Will he choose to let us go back to Greece and report that we, few as we are, were victorious over the king's forces at his very gates, and then laughed in his face and came home again? So you see what kind of a difficult situation Clearchus is in as a leader. He doesn't really have, he doesn't really know what the Persians are trying to do, and they have to just make a decision based on what the information that they have is. And so the Greeks that approached him, um, are proposing to go off on their own and just plunder what they need to and try to make their way home with the strength of their arms. Uh, but Clearchus comes back and he says, look, 
This is our best option. We don't know the territory. There are rivers to cross, major rivers. There are irrigation canals all over. We don't know the lay of the land. It's not an easy territory to navigate. Um, if you don't have boats, we don't have boats. We don't have cavalry, and this is wide open land. This is Mesopotamia. So we couldn't chase an enemy with cavalry, and if we were defeated in a battle, they could chase us and basically uh, mow us down bit by bit until they destroyed all of us. So, and Arias, by the way, he's their only ally. He's got a large army. If we try to break away now and go rogue after we've sworn these oaths and after they've you know made all these overtures to Arias, Arias is going to turn on us right away. So, uh, and he'd be kind of right to because we'd be wrong in the eyes of basically everyone in the area. We don't have any grounds on which to uh, to break our oaths now. And so Clearchus decides to stay the course. And finally, Tissaphernes gets back. And so they march on. They, they start doing the plan that he, he proposed, marching north along the Tigris. But as they're going along, Arias starts camping his army next to Tissaphernes' army instead of with the Greeks. And the Greeks are kind of holding off um, uh, some distance away with their own army and their own guides. And in this environment, scuffles happen when they're out foraging for supplies and suspicions start to arise. And after about a week on the road, they camp at the confluence of the Great Zab River and the Tigris River. And that's about 20 miles downstream from Mosul, Iraq today. And they camp there for about three days. And there's a lot of suspicion and rumors. And Xenophon's not really that explicit, but he he suggests that it's talk on either side of betraying the other, of breaking their oaths. Um, but in this situation, their camp, they have a little bit of time to rest and talk. Clearchus, the Spartan, the leader of the Greeks, he decides to go, to try to go to Tissaphernes and dispel the tension. And this is a fateful decision. Clearchus sends a messenger. Tissaphernes says, yes, come, come, Clearchus. And Clearchus goes, and he gives a speech in front of Tissaphernes that Xenophon records. It's kind of long. I'll, I'll just give you one little quote here. I resolved to have an interview with you so that, if possible, we might dispel this mutual distrust. For I know that there have been cases before now, some of them the result of slander, others of mere suspicion where men who have become fearful of one another and wished to strike before they were struck have done irreparable harm to people who were neither intending, nor for that matter, desiring to do anything of the sort to them. In this belief, then, that such misunderstandings would best be settled by conference, I have come here, etc., etc. So, you know, they're, they're kind of in a prisoner's dilemma um, situation, Clearchus wants to dispel all that. He wants to re reaffirm his commitment to the oaths. He wants to be Tissaphernes' friend. And Clearchus points out all the things that he and the Greeks could do for Tissaphernes. Tissaphernes has many pesky, rebellious peoples in his neighborhood. The Mycians, the, the Pisidians that Cyrus said that he was going to march against and didn't. So the Pisidians are still there, kind of causing problems and being rebellious. And the Egyptians are in open rebellion. And what if Tissaphernes could use this powerful army of the Greeks to solve all these problems for himself and for the king? And, uh, you know, Clearchus says, not to mention rival satraps or dynasts in the area. And if Tissaphernes is in charge of uh, this army of Greeks, well, you know, he could become a very powerful man, couldn't he? And so Clearchus is, you know, pointing out all the things that he could, that they could do for him, for Tissaphernes. And it's here that Tissaphernes starts to lay out the net. And Tissaphernes opens by saying, well, you know, we, we really would have had an easy time destroying you if we wanted to, uh, but you should trust me. I wanted to make you my friend. I wanted to prove myself trustworthy, and I wanted to win you over for myself. Um, I think we really understand each other. 
So it seems like Clearchus's words were really well placed. And then Tissaphernes lays the bait. He says, And as for all the ways in which you are of use to me, you also have mentioned some of them, but it is I who know the most important. The king alone may wear upright the tiara that is upon his head, the crown, but another too, with your help, might easily so wear the one that is upon the heart. And that's a little bit ambiguous, but he's basically suggesting that he might be interested in making a bid for the throne himself with their help. And that is very interesting. It's very interesting to Clearchus. And it's very interesting to the Greeks. And then Tissaphernes turns and he basically suggests to Clearchus then that the cause of all these suspicions has been dissenters within Clearchus's own camp who have been spreading rumors, trying to undermine Clearchus's authority, sending messages to the Persians as well. And Tissaphernes says, well, he knows who the dissenters are and he can help Clearchus get them out of the way so that these people aren't going to be able to thwart this very promising friendship between the Greeks and Tissaphernes. And he proposes that Clearchus bring all of the commanders, all of the generals and all of the captains over to Tissaphernes and his camp for a dinner. And that at that dinner, Tissaphernes will unveil who the you know, slanderers are, the dissenters are, and they can punish them. And Xenophon spends a lot of time describing all of this in, in great detail because in this book, you know, he shows how Clearchus is such a smart and careful guy, and yet Tissaphernes manages to trick him here. How? Well, let's get to that in a second, but basically Clearchus comes back to the Greeks and he reports um, the, the, the thrust of the conversation. And he insists, uh, so he, he says, let's do this, guys. And, and some of the Greek commanders are like, eh, I don't know if that's such a good idea, sending all of our leadership over there into the hands of, uh, of these untrustworthy barbarians. And, but Clearchus just insists. He's so convinced that this is the right thing to do. He's won over by Tissaphernes' words. Um, and there's one guy in particular that Clearchus really suspects was undermining him. Menon of Thessaly, who's a character that Xenophon tells a few anecdotes about. And we'll get a, a little later into Menon just briefly. Um, but so Clearchus insists and he manages to, to convince uh, five generals and 20 captains, which is the majority of their officer corps, to all go to dinner at Tissaphernes' camp. And here's what Xenophon says happens next. When they reached Tissaphernes' doors, the generals were invited in. Proxenus the Boeotian, Menon the Thessalian, Agius the Arcadian, Clearchus the Laconian, and Socrates the Achaean, while the captains waited at the doors. Not long afterward, at the same signal, those within were seized, and those outside were cut down. After this, some of the barbarian horsemen rode about over the plain and killed every Greek they met, whether slave or free man. And the Greeks wondered at this riding about as they saw it from their camp, and they were puzzled to know what the horsemen were doing, until Nicarchus the Arcadian reached the camp in flight, wounded in his belly and holding his bowels in his hands, and told all that had happened. And thereupon the Greeks, one and all, ran to their arms, panic-stricken and believing that the enemy would come at once to the camp. And there's not a big, you know, military action on the part of the barbarians, on the part of the Persians. Instead, an embassy comes. Arius is one of them. And he and the other Persians, they tell the Greeks some story about Clearchus 
being caught perjuring himself, betraying his oaths, but that the other captains, well, the other generals, are safe. And then he says, For yourselves the king demands your arms, for he says that they belong to him, since they belonged to Cyrus, his slave. The Greeks are not happy with this, understandably, uh, and they accuse Arias of treachery. And Xenophon says, well, Xenophon is there, uh, first of all, which is noteworthy, and he he speaks, speaks up and he says, well, if... The other generals are really okay, because Arias said that Proxenus and Menon were, you know, that they informed upon Clearchus and that they're going to get rewarded from the king, which Xenophon suspects is BS. He says, well, they're, if they're really okay, why don't you just send them to us to make, you know, tell us what happened? And, like, did you not see this coming? So Arias takes counsel with uh, the other Persians in the embassy and they kind of spend a while just talking it over, and then they just leave without saying anything. And that's where the narrative stops off itself in chapter two. Once again, confusion, and this time, confusion mixed with deceit. Xenophon, sort of to close the chapter, he says, what they later found out happened to the generals. The generals then, after being thus seized, were taken to the king and put to death by being beheaded. At this point, Xenophon gives a little epitaph on the three most prominent generals. And this is really rare in ancient history, and uh, I think it's probably rare in history in general, where you have someone who is a direct participant in leadership of a great expedition or a plan, um, and they give an objective and well-written description of the character of the other leaders involved. And you could kind of compare maybe Lawrence of Arabia's Seven Pillars of Wisdom, T.E. Lawrence. Um, But I think this is so rare and interesting. I'm going to read these short epitaphs of the commanders for you. They're possibly the most interesting part of the book from a leadership perspective. I I found them just really fascinating. So anyway, I'll I'll, I'll read here. So first is Clearchus, and I'm actually going to end up repeating some a little bit of what I read last time, but it kind of gives you the context. All right, so uh, the generals are put to death. One of them, Clearchus, by common consent of all who were personally acquainted with him, seemed to have shown himself a man who was both fitted for war and fond of war to the last degree. For in the first place, as long as the Lacedaemonians were at war with the Athenians, he bore his part with them. And then as soon as peace had come... He persuaded his state, Lacedaemon is Sparta, remember? He persuaded his state that the Thracians were injuring the Greeks, and after gaining his point as best as he could from the ephors, the authorities at Sparta, he set sail with the intention of making war upon the Thracians who dwelt beyond the Chersonese in Perinthus. When, however, the ephors changed their minds for some reason or other, and after he had already gone, tried to turn him back from the isthmus of Corinth, At that point, he declined to render any further obedience, but went sailing off to the Hellespont. As a result, he was condemned to death by the authorities at Sparta on the ground of disobedience to orders. Being now in exile, he came to Cyrus, and the arguments whereby he persuaded Cyrus are recorded elsewhere. At any rate, Cyrus gave him 10,000 derricks, a lot of money, and he, upon receiving this money, did not turn his thoughts to comfortable idleness, but used it to collect an army and proceeded to make war upon the Thracians. He defeated them in battle and from that time on plundered them in every way and he kept up the war until Cyrus wanted his army. Then he returned, still for the purpose of making war, this time in company with Cyrus. Now such conduct as this, in my opinion, reveals a man fond of war, philopolemos in Greek, When he may enjoy peace without dishonor or harm, he chooses war. When he may live in idleness, he prefers toil, provided it be the toil of war. When he may keep his money without risk, he elects to diminish it by carrying on war. Have you known anybody like that? Maybe not with war, but maybe with business or some other pursuit? going on. As for Clearchus, just as one spends upon a loved one, 
or upon any other pleasure, so he wanted to spend upon war. Such a lover he was of war. On the other hand, he seemed to be fitted for war in that he was fond of danger, ready by day or night to lead his troops against the enemy and self-possessed amid terrors, as all who were with him on all occasions agreed, he was likewise said to be fitted for leadership, so far as that was possible for a man of such a disposition as, he, as his was. For example, he was competent, if ever a man was, in devising ways by which his army might get provisions, and in procuring them, and he was competent also to impress it upon those who were with him that Clearchus must be obeyed. This result he accomplished by being severe, for he was gloomy in appearance and harsh in voice, and he used to punish severely, sometimes in anger, so that on occasion he would be sorry afterwards. Yet he also punished on principle, for he believed there was no good in an army that went without punishment. In fact, he used to say, it was reported, that a soldier must fear his commander more than the enemy, if he were to perform guard duty or keep his hands from friends or without making excuses advance upon the enemy. In the midst of dangers, therefore, the troops were ready to obey Clearchus implicitly and would choose no other to command them. For they said that at such times his gloominess shined as brightness in the faces of others, and his severity seemed to be resolution against the enemy, so that it appeared to be token safety and to be no longer severity. But when they had got past the danger and could go off to serve under other commanders, many would desert him, for there was no attractiveness about him. But he was always severe and rough, so that the soldiers had the same feeling toward him that boys have toward a schoolmaster. For this reason also he never had men following him out of friendship and goodwill, but such as were under him because they had been put in his hands by a government or by their own need or were under compulsion of any other necessity, yielded him implicit obedience. And as soon as they began in his service to overcome the enemy, from that moment there were weighty reasons which made his soldiers efficient, for they had the feeling of confidence in the face of the enemy, and their fear of punishment at his hands kept them in a fine state of discipline. Such he was as a commander but being commanded by others was not especially to his liking, so people said. He was about 50 years old at the time of his death. So I think you can see there that Tissaphernes had found Clearchus' weakness. Clearchus loved war. He flourished in war. He derived all of the prestige that he got from other men in war. And in times of peace, he would be kind of ignored and, uh, and no one wanted to be around him. And so, you know, Tissaphernes has Arias in his camp for a long time and he's, he's really getting, the, getting all the information on the Greeks and their quarrels and their characters. And so Tissaphernes found the thing that Clearchus loved and desired more than anything else and he used it to bait him and to trick this otherwise brilliant and cautious and savvy commander. And uh, he was tricking him with the prospect of the greatest thing that Clearchus could ever hope for, you know, the, 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 the greatest victory that anybody could ever win in those days would have been a victory against the Persian king. So, you know, it was sort of like, how could Clearchus resist? And Tissaphernes figured this out. Um, and, that, and that greed or that, that desire blinded him. So then Xenophon goes on, uh, and this is shorter, the next two epitaphs are shorter than that one. So Xenophon goes on to his friend, Proxenus of Thebes. And this is the guy who invited Xenophon on the expedition. Uh, he, Proxenus introduced Xenophon to Cyrus. Uh, well, Xenophon mentions that actually, and he waits till book three to tell you his kind of backstory. But um, so, so that's, that's who Proxenus is. Um, God rest his soul. And here, here's Xenophon's epitaph. Proxenus the Boeotian, cherished from his earliest youth, an eager desire to become a man capable of dealing with great affairs. And because of this desire, he paid money to Gorgias of Leontini. And Gorgias of Leontini is a 
a famous teacher, a famous rhetorician, a famous professor of rhetoric, you might say, uh, an educational entrepreneur. He's kind of a competitor of Socrates. He appears in a couple of Plato's dialogues. Um, so, so Proxenus was a student of Gorgias, and uh, Xenophon was a student of Socrates. So going on here, after having studied under him, under Gorgias, and reaching the conclusion that he had now become competent to rule and through friendship with the foremost men of his day to hold his own in conferring benefits, Proxenus embarked upon this enterprise with Cyrus, expecting to gain therefrom a famous name, great power, and abundant wealth. But while vehemently desiring these great ends, he nevertheless, nevertheless made it evident also that he would not care to gain any one of them unjustly. Rather, he thought that he must secure them justly and honorably, or not at all. As a leader, he was fit to command gentlemen, but he was not capable of inspiring his soldiers with either respect for himself or fear. On the contrary, he really stood in greater awe of his men than they whom he commanded did of him. And it was manifest that he was more afraid of incurring the hatred of his soldiers than they were of disobeying him. Have you ever met a leader like that? Going on here. His idea was that for a man to be and to be thought fit to command, it was enough that he should praise the one who did right and withhold praise from the one who did wrong. Consequently, all among his associates who were gentlemen were attached to him, but the unprincipled would plot against him in the thought that he was easy to deal with. At the time of his death, he was about 30 years old. And finally here, Xenophon addresses Menon of Thessaly. And this is the guy that Clearchus thought wanted to undermine him. And he may well have been right. Um, but uh, Menon ended kind of like the rest of them. And, you know, given how measured and objective Xenophon is about the people he admires, um, just, well, what do you think of this? Men on the Thessalian was manifestly eager for enormous wealth, eager for command in order to get more wealth, and eager for honor in order to increase his gains. And he desired to be a friend to the men who possessed greatest power in order that he might commit unjust deeds without suffering the penalty. Again, for the accomplishment of the objects upon which his heart was set, he imagined that the shortest route was by way of perjury and falsehood and deception. While he counted straightforwardness and truth, the same thing as folly. Affection he clearly felt for nobody. And if he said that he was a friend to anyone, it would become plain that this was the man that he was plotting against. He would never ridicule an enemy, but he always gave the impression in conversation of ridiculing all his associates. Neither would he devise schemes against his enemy's property, for he saw the difficulty in getting hold of the possessions of people who were on their guard. But he thought he was the only one who knew that it was easiest to get hold of the property of friends, just because it was unguarded. I mean, Xenophon really detests this man, and you kind of wonder why people followed Menon. Maybe he was rich, I don't know. Again, all whom he found to be perjurers and wrongdoers, he would fear, regarding them as well-armed, while those who were pious and practiced truth, he would try to make use of them, regarding them as weaklings. He kind of reminds you of like a, a depraved Thrasymachus, uh, you know, from... Uh, from Plato's Republic, or uh, Callicles from Plato's Gorgias. Um, going on here, we're almost done. And just as a man prides himself upon piety, truthfulness, and justice, so Menon prided himself upon ability to deceive, the fabrication of lies, and the mocking of friends. But the man who is not a rascal, he always thought of as belonging to the uneducated. Again, if he were attempting to be first in the friendship of anybody, he thought that slandering those who were already first was the necessary way of gaining this end. In other words, if you want to be somebody's friend, 
tell him their other friends suck. <laughs> As for making his soldiers obedient, he managed that by bearing a share in their wrongdoing. He expected indeed, I guess that's your answer there, um, about you know how he got people to follow him. He expected indeed to gain honor and attention by showing that he had the ability and would have the readiness to do the most wrongs. And he set it down as a kindness whenever anyone broke off with him, that he had not, while still on terms with such a one, destroyed him. So that's, that's and he gives a little bit more details on Menon. I'll skip ahead. Um, Menon was not like Clearchus and the rest of the generals beheaded, a manner of death which is counted speediest, but report says that he was tortured alive for a year and so met the death of a scoundrel. So maybe there is some justice in the world. Um, and he mentions the two other generals and with a kind of a brief epitaph here that I, I, I like. So he says, Agius the Arcadian and Socrates the Achaean were the other two who were put to death. No one ever laughed at these men as weaklings in war or found fault with them in the matter of friendship. They were both about 35 years of age. And so ends book two. So why did the king turn on them? What do you think? Well, let's take that one on next time. Uh, hopefully you like the book. Remember, if you want to buy it, click the link in the show notes. I get a little commission there from Amazon. Uh, I do like the landmark edition among those I listed. That's an easy way to support the podcast. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time.